on page 110 out of 428 in uh, Jim Garrison's David Ferry file. I believe this is Jim Garrison's David Ferry file. The portions of this are in his files, but this might be the FBI's compilation. I don't recall offhand. Um, <coughs> Left off here. So, all right. Um, so this appears to be a letter dated February 21st, 1967. Chandler in the upper right-hand corner. Memo to Billings. That's Dick Billings uh, from Chandler. Here with two pickup photos of Arcacha Smith plus confidential report on conversation with R. Don't know who R is. Could it be Ruby? Possible. Who knows? Did Ruby know these guys in New Orleans? Of course he did. Of course he did. Of course he did. It's ridiculous uh, to even think otherwise. So, have unofficial okay from R to copy photos or part of photos and official arrangements to use payment or credit wasn't discussed. Request soonest return of photos to me airmail special delivery. Had lunch this afternoon with R and her husband. Ah, so R is a female. Uh, R and her husband at Emerald Door Restaurant. Uh, she says two nights ago she received a call and later met a man who identified himself and said her husband had once done him a large favor. Informer said no circumstances, uh, wants his name revealed, and she didn't tell me. This is written in kind of a broken English, but not like a Spanish broken English. Just uh, seems to be just poor, uh, you know, grammatical structure. Uh, informant says in 1959 through 1961, he, member of CAP, oh, he's, this is kind of like abbreviated writing, I guess, member of CAP group here, and member of Marine Reserve Unit based at Alvin Calendar Field, a Navy Reserve air station in Plaque Mines Parish, 20 miles from New Orleans. Informant is electronics technician who has several federal contracts says in 1959 he because of cap connection and electronic training approached by ferry who he knew well and arcacha all right so let me reanalyze this statement um says in 1959 he because of cap connection and electronic training approached by ferry who he knew well and arcacha however the problem is here like arcacha didn't get to new orleans till 1960. So I'm not even going to touch upon that. We're going to keep going. Uh, they asked if he would help in training anti-Castro guerrillas being trained by Ferry and Arcacha in an abandoned portion of, of calendar with live ammunition and M1s and other military ordnance. Informant declined because of his government contracts, but agreed to act as a repository of information for Ferry and Arcacha in case they ever got into trouble and needed someone to testify to their activities. Because of that relationship, he was kept well posted. Interesting. This is interesting. This, for me, doesn't really have anything to do with the assassination, but it speaks as to the logistics of Ferry's operation, right? Because everything in the fucking world has logistics. You can't ignore logistics ever. How did things actually happen, right? What steps were taken to ensure that Ferry uh, could carry on these um, operations, right? Because Ferry was involved, obviously, with um, the Interpen guys, Jerry Hemming and all his fucking crew from Miami, but in New Orleans, um, north of Lake Pontchartrain, actually, at the training camp up there. I always forget the name of the town that that's in, but that was most certainly a exp an expensive operation. It had tons of weapon, ammunition. Um, people don't just go and train for free. They get paid. So there was a large amount of money flowing through that operation. And when you come to understand who David Ferry is, you know, it's weird because the guy seems to have lived like an impoverished life. Like he was broke all the time, but According to people who knew him, at any given time, he had a pocket full of $100 bills. But he lived like a complete and total fucking wretch. I 
I take a lot of time on these these fine details because under to understand a segment of history you have to know who you're dealing with you have to understand these people you have to really come to terms with who these people were and how they thought about everything and then the relationships that they had with each other i i i, I can't fucking emphasize enough the study of the assassination is the study of relationships. That's it. Relationships. When you come to understand the relationships, everything else will fall into place. All right, so let's continue. <clears throat> They asked if he would help in training anti-Castro guerrillas being trained by Ferry and Arcacha in an abandoned portion of Calendar with live ammunition and M1s and other military ordnance. Informant declined because of his government contracts, but agreed to act as a repository of information. So yes, this is extremely important stuff because this goes to show that there were, despite the fact that Ferry's activities were completely off book, um... After he left the Civil Air Patrol back in, like, what, 56? Or was it 57? I don't know what year it was, but he went on to form the fi the Fighting Falcon Squad, which was totally a fucking black operation. Totally not sponsored by any official government entity. He did it on his own. However, it appears that he had back channels to the government to support him and testify to his activities, right? So this is how black operations work. They're technically on their own, so the government can maintain their plausible deniability. But if you dig hard enough, you'll find a guy who kind of on his own, really not connected to the government, um, decided to take it upon himself to help out Ferry and, you know, uh, have his back in case he ever gets into trouble, as per his own fucking... Uh, statements here right so um now the larger question that some might ask is this part of the assassination is this intelligence infrastructure part of the assassination not necessarily uh this infrastructure was in place here and would have continued in place or maybe not but uh independently of the assassination now could you say that this infrastructure was utilized in the assassination and i think uh sure in a, in a very supporting foundational manner um but this is the backdrop uh that i i feel everyone should really come to understand because this is um david ferry was the fucking man he the, the assassination centered around him uh by far the most important operative on the ground at the grassy knoll behind the book depository at the tippet shooting and then i believe uh later he'll appear at the belmont address the belmont address that um fuck i can't believe i can't remember his name david wayne house david wayne house gets arrested um with kenneth glenn wilson at the belmont address which i believe there's a Belmont address in Fort Worth and there's a Belmont address in Dallas. Um, I believe at one point I mixed the two up, but I believe ultimately it's the Belmont address in Fort Worth, which is relevant because this is the address uh, that David Wayne House and Kenneth Glenn Wilson get arrested at. And when the cops show up and they call it out over the radio, they identify in the driveway the light-colored Ford Falcon station wagon. Well, they don't say station wagon, but it's obviously the station wagon the station wagon that david ferry drives back to new orleans in right so there are numerous of these like safe houses around this one on belmont in fort worth is uh key becomes key because uh almost immediately after the tippet shooting david ferry who's in the great plymouth heads to the belmont address this is my opinion um before he gets there the cops show up arrest david wayne house call out that the light-colored Ford Falcon is in the driveway. At some point, the gray Plymouth, owned by Carl Mathers, that is being driven around by David Ferry, ends up back at Carl Mathers' house. Um, David Ferry ends up in that light-colored Ford 
Falcon station wagon turns out to be light blue, as confirmed by Thomas Compton, which I think we covered a little bit last time. Uh, and we will cover again as we get to the Galveston trip. Um, <coughs> but, uh, all right, so I completely lost track of what the fuck I'm talking about, and so that's a good sign that I need to continue with the document. <sighs> so this person who is uh, obviously government, obviously supporting David Ferry in his illegal activities, and what were those illegal activities? Really, they were ultimately a child trafficking operation that he was using the Civil Air Patrol for. Uh, and as we get to the end of this document, we'll connect him to a series of uh, churches, uh, kind of ironic. Um, and we'll see that the, all the the priests involved in these churches are like, are they really priests? Well, Garrison and the FBI couldn't figure that one out either. So <laughs> uh, that tells me they're CIA related priests all involved in a large scale child trafficking operation. And that was one of the biggest things about David Ferry that they needed to keep kind of hidden. And why he was kind of kept out of the official story stuff because um, he was 100% a fucking pilot involved in flying these kids around in this uh, child trafficking operation. Uh, and that will become apparent by the time we get to the end of this document. He says, revolutionaries operated at a field under guise of being CAP group, which they weren't. He's talking about the Fighting Falcon Squadron. Uh, his Marine Reserve unit at one time was asked to help train this group. And he personally observed Ferry and Arcacha giving rifle training to a group of 20 or so men. Mm-hmm. Let me screenshot this because that I can probably squeeze into my current chapter. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that's important that, I have to, that I'm highlighting in, the, in this chapter I'm working on in my book, or actually I'm pretty close to finish it. Or what does it mean to finish a chapter? I haven't even figured that out yet. But uh, the reality is uh, Arcacha and Ferry had a very close relationship. And when you go through like the documents on Arcacha, he downplays the relationship over and over again. Like, oh, I knew the guy didn't really like him. He was kind of weird, you know. Uh, but no, like uh, we have witnesses that put Arcacha and Ferry all the fuck over the place, basically starting around the time Arcacha shows up in New Orleans in, uh, it was either January, February of 1960. At the time, Ferry and Arcacha were also employed by U.S. immigration to be present any time groups of Cuban refugees arrived in New Orleans and uh, and identify known communists. See, that's, that's gold right there also. FYI, our said states item reporter uh states item reporter and time stringer david snyder asked ferry about working for immigration and ferry said no however says informant every time refugee group was due to arrive arcacha would be jailed on pretext by new orleans police and ferry would be jailed by jefferson parish police where ferry resided then they thus were prevented from identifying incoming cubans hmm interesting Connected to the assassination? No. Ultimately important backstory? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is like the, this is the, where the flavor comes from. This is like the, the mm, this is the, these fine details that just give texture to the background, right? I mean, no different from a from a an incredible painting, right? Um, if you don't just fucking love history, like there's something wrong with you, really. Uh, this is just the greatest shit in the world. I'm going to read this again. However, says informant, every time refugee group is due to arrive, Arcacha would be jailed on pretext by New Orleans police and Ferry would be jailed by Jefferson Parish, uh, where Ferry resided then. Interesting stuff. They thus were prevented from identifying incoming Cubans. Why would somebody want to prevent them from identifying incoming Cubans? Informant believes Orleans uh, harassment directed by then District Attorney Richard Doling. And Jeff harassment, uh, it's Jefferson Parish uh, harassment directed by the sheriff Jack Fitzgerald, both had strong Marcello ties. Hmm, interesting. This starts to paint <clears throat> a picture of the background of the previous. Uh, hierarchy, uh, upper administration, uh, bureaucracy that existed in New Orleans prior to Jim Garrison 
uh, being the district attorney. So you can see an era of corruption that Jim Garrison moved into and reformed. Or did he reform? Because he allegedly had ties to Marcello also. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. I'm going to double snap that. You know it's important when you double snap it. Or I'm just high and can't remember if I snapped it or not. <clears throat> In R's presence, informant phoned uh, one Jim Marsh, who also knows Ferry. Let me pause right here. So, if you're a real fucking nerd, a real fucking nerd, what you would do is, and I'm not there yet, I have way too much to do, but I want to do it. You'd make a fucking map, right, with David Ferry, and you'd start to plug in these obscure names that no one talks about in the Kennedy assassination, right? Um, you'd start to make a little map and then you start to do research on each individual person. And I promise you, you will find, well, besides the fact that all these people will be connected to Marcello, which means they're connected to the mob, which means they're all corrupt. Um, <clears throat> you will begin to find connections to Dallas and Jack Ruby and from Jack Ruby to, you know, who, and from you know who via Meyer Lansky back to the Israelis, right? So, hmm. <clears throat> in our presence, informant phoned one Jim Marsh, who also knows Ferry and belonged to a CAP group. And Marsh claimed Ferry had flown Oswald to Cuba in 1959 in a Stinson. So that statement's bullshit. Um, that, that didn't happen. Uh, there's really... Looking at a couple factors, looking at the tension between Cuba and us at the time, and particularly between Cuba and the CIA, um, because this is when the relationship started to falter before it picked up again after the Bay of Pigs, which we'll get to one day. But this is sketchy uh, in the first place. It sure as shit wasn't Oswald. Oswald leaves for the Soviet Union in 1959. The person who would it would have been if this person was impersonating Oswald at the time would have been Carrie Thornley. However, I'm really not too solid on Carrie Thornley having time to go fucking moonlighting with David Ferry in 1959 because that's at a time when he's getting shuffled around to California and then at Sugi and all the fuck over the place where Oswald is, right? Keeping tabs on Oswald and Oswald's um, platoon or whatever the fuck they call that group that he's in in the Marines, um, which was going on also in 1959. So Kerry Thornley was a busy motherfucker if, in fact, this it did happen and this was Kerry Thornley because it sure as shit was not Lee Harvey Oswald. <clears throat> now, did Ferry go to Cuba? Of course, Ferry was definitely going to Cuba. He was tied up with the fucking mob in the CIA when the CIA was fucking friends with Castro, right? Um... One day we'll get to the Fair Play for Cuba Committee stuff, uh, which I don't want to sidetrack on it today, but it's all connected to this also. Informant also phoned one Mike Finney, who also CAP group member and informant asked Finney, Dave Ferry didn't know Oswald, did he? Finney replied, yeah, sure, and so did I. Informant said these persons were among those being trained as revolutionaries. Hmm. Okay, so let's remember the photograph of Oswald in David Ferry's presence was in 1956 at the CAP barbecue. I do not believe any of the other men in the photograph, or boys you could call them at the time, um, are relevant to the story in the 60s when it's being investigated um, and no connection to the assassination. Uh, there might be the exception, maybe Ed Vobel. Uh, I don't recall uh, that I'll have to look into. Ed Vobel went to school with Oswald. Let's call him Oswald number one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Oswald number one at Beauregard uh, Junior High School, right? He knew this kid, Ed Vobel. So 
Um, Ed Vobel was also in CAP, and he might have been in that photograph because the timing fits, but I don't know about that. Other than that, there are no other relevant people in that photograph other than Oswald and David Ferry. Um, now, for the record, that the, the person in that photograph, Lee Harvey Oswald, I 100% believe was not the person arrested um, on November 22nd at all. And a lot of the information on that, uh, John Armstrong did a great job on. You can look at a harveyandlee.net website um, and read all of John Armstrong's stuff. And he got a lot of stuff wrong, but he did get a lot of stuff right. And um, uh, one day I, I will do a show on that stuff. Um, the duplicate Oswalds post-1947, right? Because there were two Oswalds going back to 47. Uh, un unless the documents are fake, which it doesn't appear to be because they went the CIA went to great uh, lengths to hide that information. Um, so, but who knows? This, who, you, you can't ever tell with the CIA what the fuck their double, triple whammy of the day is. So, but it appears as though there were two Oswalds post-1947. And John Armstrong's work on it is kind of, despite his horrible conclusions of what he did with the data he dug up, uh, the data that he dug up is kind of irrefutable. So, um, but let me continue here. So the guys he's um, acknowledging were involved as being trained as revolutionaries along with Oswald are these guys. But, uh, but I can tell you right now, something's wrong here. Uh, Ivy Rodriguez Jr., who informant says very close to Arcacha and should have key information. Uh, Johnny Johnston, phonetic, now associated with Tulane University and close to Ferry, addresses uh, 1503 Thomas. Uh, and Leighton Martins, but see, Martins is younger. Martins is like 18 or 19 at the time of the assassination. Oswald's 24. They had no association between Leighton Martins and Oswald. Um, Oswald knew David Ferry in 1956. Leighton Martin, uh, he didn't know David Ferry in 56. In 56, Leighton Martins would have been like t fucking 12 or something like that. And I don't know that Leighton Martins was involved uh, in the CAP that early. I think Leighton Martins was only involved with the Fighting Falcon Squadron, which would have been like 58 or 59. 59, man. Every time 50, the year 59 pops up in the assassination, like little fucking bells are start ringing in my head. Like uh, 59 appears to have been a major turning point for... Obviously, Kennedy wasn't even fucking president yet. They weren't planning on killing the guy before he was in office. Um, but they were planning something with the duplicate Oswalds, right? And the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Informant says in this period, Ferry went to Guy Bannister to see if he could get harassment stopped. And Bannister showed Ferry an informant letter from House Un-American... Uh, it's the House Un-American Committee, I forget what the official name is, etc., saying that D.A. Dowling was under investigation for communist ties. On behalf of Ferry, informant also talked to FBI locally in an attempt to ease harassment and was referred to Washington. He was told by someone in Hoover's office, you'd better not get involved in this thing and tell your friends they'll be better off out of New Orleans. He called Justice Department shortly thereafter and was told the same thing in almost identical words. He had impression Justice Department had been briefed on him by the Bureau. He took the advice and stopped all intimate association with Ferry and doesn't know what happened to Ferry, Arcacha, or Cubans thereafter. Informant also said he was told in this period by Ferry and Arcacha that the illegal Jefferson Gambling Casino Beverly Club was jointly owned by Marcelo and Batista, whom he uh, assumed to be the ex-dictator. Said he didn't know why Dowling and Fitzgerald were harassing F and A, but felt either they had been bought off or were being used. <clears throat> so he must be talking about uh, a, a gambling club in Jefferson Parish, co-owned by Marcelo and Batista, the former dictator who got run out of Cuba by... Um, Fidel Castro. Hmm. Informant believes Orlando Piedra of Miami knows details of Marcelo Batista Beverly Club arrangement. Piedra, as you know, was former Batista police chief. 
he came to to Orleans in 61 or thereabouts and bought a house on the lakefront. Bill Stuckey did state's item story on him at the time, showing documents pertaining to Raul and Fidel. He's talking Castro, uh, which Fiedra had stolen. Okay, so let me make um, uh, let me make a, a very important. God damn it! I hate when I have to go back and rewrite shit because I realize new shit. All right, so <clears throat> this is super important. Why? Because this uh, brings us to the role of Sergio Arcacha and how Arcacha was connected directly to uh, Marcelo and the mafia, right? Because Marcelo worked under Batista as an ambassador to India, right? Uh, when the fuck did Batista take that? He got that position in like 56 through 50 eight or 59 then he makes his way to the states or was he in, in, no he was back from columbia university way before that and so yeah and so then he makes it to new orleans by january february of 1960 yeah so that's perfectly fits the timeline uh, but it just goes to show the relationships remember relationships are every everything right so despite your not having seen anything that that specifically states that um, Batista interacted with Arcacha. Once Arcacha and Batista make it to New Orleans post-1960, we know with absolute certainty that Marcelo had relations to the FRD, um, which was the uh, Frente Revolutionary Democratico uh, bullshit CIA Cuba organization that was going to funnel money from Marcelo um, to allegedly Cubans for after uh, Castro gets outed, right? It's all bullshit, right? It was all nonsense. Uh, I, I, the shit makes me, cracks me up when you come to understand the real relationships and then the relationships they allege on paper. It's fucking hilarious. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Arcacha <clears throat> obviously knew Batista. Batista had a fucking assigned him as to be the, the, the um, ambassador to India. Right. So but now you have Marcelo and Batista working together in this Beverly Club arrangement. Do you really think that Sergio Arcacha, who would work for Batista and who currently works with Marcelo, is not going to fucking be in on this somehow, even on a social level? Give me a break. Of course they were. So these things here go to facilitate a better understanding of the relationships between um, Arcacha and the mob. Right. So. This is, it, I find this to be very, very important and very relevant. And like I said, relationships are everything. Um, and this goes to show, again, that if Sergio Arcacha and Emilio Santana, the only anti-Castro, quote-unquote, anti-Castro Cubans um, in the mix in the assassination, if they're involved as shooters, now, are they fucking there as anti-Castro Cubans? No. They're there, obviously, under the uh, auspices of Marcelo, right? And it would be the relationship that they personally have with the mafia and the CIA. And the fact that, they're, that they uh, gave this, gave this uh, facade of anti-Castro Cubans, right? Because they didn't give a fuck about Cuba. Once they got out of Cuba, all they gave a fuck about was putting money in their pockets. Okay? People come to really come to get a grip on where the fucking money went. Because the money that was raised for the anti-Castro Cubans never made it to fucking Cuba or any of the anti-Castro Cubans. Okay? It made it to Israel where they ended up spending that fucking money to fight the Palestinians. All right? So, God, that shit just pisses me off to no end. <clears throat> but this is so important to me because it just shows the relationship between Arcacha and Marcelo and that, to me, it is ultimately debunks and eliminates the need to look at anything anti-Castro Cuban related when it comes to the assassination. It's a fucking CIA ploy to get you to look to the right while all the real shit is to the left. Fuck the anti-Castro Cubans. The only two anti-Castro Cubans, Emilio Santana and Sergio Arcacha, were working on behalf of the mob. That's what the orders came down from. Okay? And the CIA through David Ferry. So fuck anybody who talks about the anti-Castro Cubans were a partner. I read an article that Eugenio and whoever the fuck does the Kennedys and King website. It's so fucking ridiculous. Okay, let me talk. Let me just comment on this real quick. These motherfucking Kennedy researchers sometimes are just amazing at digging up data. 
and totally fucking have no idea how to interpret that data and come to these conclusions that are so fucking stupid. Like the idea that anti-Castro Cubans had an equal pull as the CIA in the assassination of Kennedy. It, it, oh my God. It's so dumb. It's so dumb. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm speechless. It's so fucking dumb. All right. These guys were there. They were Cubans. They weren't there on behalf of anti-Castro Cuban nothing. They were there because of fucking Marcelo hired them and paid them to go there. Mm. All right. So where was I? All right, I already read over this. Let's continue. R says, person who can locate Piedra is Dr. Jorge Garcia Montez, uh, 520 Girona, Coral Gables. Another of R's contacts says, uh, Garcia Montez has information about Oswald heretofore unknown. <laughs> I love words like heretofore. R says, Arcacha worked for both uh Full gun, uh, work for Batista and Castro. That is true. Uh, other infos on uh, Riley of Riley Coffee Company. Here we go. Called employer of R's husband. Hold on a second. Let me try to see if I can't mesh this into the proper uh, sequence. Put the proper pegs in the right holes here. Other infos from R. And then we jump to Riley of Riley Coffee Company. Now, is R. Riley of Riley Coffee Company the same R that we have been talking about this whole time? Because remember, these files not only are they incomplete, they're not always they're not specific. These are internal memos, right? So who the fuck was R and is R the same R of R. Riley? And if so, that's important because that becomes Oswald's alleged boss at the coffee company, which I'm telling you, fucking Oswald never worked there. It was a front company. He got a CIA paycheck through uh, R. Riley of the Riley Coffee Company. All right. So that puts a whole new context on everything we just fucking went over. Right. This is why, as a researcher, you end up reading the same shit like 10 times. Because you'll read like 10 pages, and then you'll find out the fucking informant that you were reading about is this person over here. And then that changes the entire context, right? Then you got to go back and read the whole thing in the proper context and be like, oh, fuck. Now I understand. <clears throat> Other infos from R. Riley of Riley Coffee Company called employer of R's husband. Called employer of R's husband. So this, we're dealing with two different R's here. All right. So, so no, the, the, the R that we have been referring to is not R. Riley of Riley Coffee Company. This is a second R. So cool. I don't have to reread shit and I don't have to change my understanding of the context. Uh, R puzzled about why and I told her I don't know maybe Riley just jittery since Oswald once worked for him <laughs> well yeah imagine uh, imagine having a front CIA front company right you put CIA people on the fucking payroll they pay that payroll and then it turns out fucking uh, that you had a the guy who shot the president on the fucking payroll look imagine how the C uh, you uh, you are made to look right at the behest of the fucking CIA you, know, you look like a total dick now right you're like fuck uh, and, and, and then you have to dodge questions and all kinds of shit and come up with excuses and fake work records and the whole nine yards. Oof. <laughs> Man, Garrison fucked these guys on a scale like us. <laughs> I, I promise, like, the vast majority of documents that we do have that they did fabricate, they fabricated because Garrison was onto them and they needed to come up with some shit and they didn't have anything. Anonymous Calder told R that Garrison is seeking Manuel Quesada for questioning. That name becomes irrelevant. R has been advised to contact uh, Andreas uh, Pinea, phonetic patron of Los Americas Bo Bar here and former Batista policeman for info on Ferry, Arcacha, maybe Oswald. So let me remind everybody, when you see Oswald in the context of Ferry and Arcacha, it is 100% not Oswald, it is Carrie Thornley. 100% of the time. Including all the activities at 544 Camp Street. Uh, allegedly, Oswald stamped the fucking um, flyers for Fair Play for Cuba Committee with 544 Camp Street, right? And that allegedly con connects Oswald to the CIA, right? That's the official conspiracy theory. Uh, but no, it wasn't Oswald. Oswald never stamped shit and never had any flyers printed. That was all Carrie Thornley, and it was handed to Oswald as an assignment. Uh, and so whenever you see, 100% of the time, 
the context of Oswald in as far as Ferry and Arcatra or anything going on in fucking New Orleans outside of Marina Oswald, and sometimes Marina, is not Oswald, it's Carrie Thornley. And that's the chapter I'm working on in my book as we speak. I'm about a page and a half into it. I hope to finish it this week. Um, so, all right, uh, let me continue. R and her husband both have suspicion electronics informant, maybe government agent. You don't say. <laughs> R says uh, she sold, is that sold or told? Who knows? By Q, uh, Told by Cuban woman here named uh, Sir Niglia that Garrison asked her for address of Cuban priest named uh, Father Testes. Great, phonetic uh, in Houston. Uh, Testes arriving February 23rd and is asked meeting with Garrison. R says she's willing to continue feed me information. Uh, what she and John Wilds want in return is my help. See that state's item not embarrassingly scooped, uh, particularly by local television. So what I'm seeing here is a scheme to plant false information for a deal to not put certain information out. Okay, so uh, everything we just read has to have a taken with a grain of salt or grain of sand. I never fucking remember what that fucking saying is. Uh, said they understand my commitment to life, but just don't want to be locally embarrassed. Life magazine, that is. Uh, I told R I thought I could do that with understanding I must be protected and with provision that any time I might be cut from information. They in, they uninterested in getting specific leads from me, and newspaper is quitting story until it looks like Garrison doing something. This agreement was more implied than spelled out in words and, of course, leaves you and the magazine the option of cutting me off from information when and if it becomes necessary. R said she and Wilds originally intended give foregoing information to Garrison, but his conduct changed their mind. Uh, yeah, I'm sensing a bunch of nonsense. Uh, it is my opinion that she and Wilds gave me the information so that later they will feel justified in asking me what I did with it and what their leads developed. I assume this is their motive, since I can't see any other. Uh, on another matter, Clay Shaw's mother has a house in Hammond. Hmm. I thought it was in Alexandria, but I, this is the second time this week I've seen the reference to Hammond. It might have just been the hotel that Clay Shaw stayed at in, was in Alexandria. Clay Shaw's trip, uh, I'm still working out. He was definitely in Dallas. Uh, he was in Dallas with Erwin Heyman of the Jewish Agency in Switzerland. Um, he was not on a train to fucking Portland, um, but I still need to take a couple months to really dig into Clay Shaw, not making it into this first book. Um, it is listed under the name G.L. Shaw. So, um, P.S. Pershing has been important source for R as to lesser degree Judge Frank Shea. God, despite the amount of work I've put into Kennedy, I tell you, um, I, I've, I've uncovered maybe 30% of the story. Maybe 30%. <clears throat> All right, uh, dear Dick, uh, this is to Dick Billings, December 7th, 1966. here with a suggestion concerning live uh, concerning television ads but before getting into that i have a story to tell you which be uh, which may be no more than interesting gossip but if life plans to do more on the assassination it might be worth filling or filling or filing hmm. uh, a new orleans detective 12 years on the force college education says oswald was connected with a weirdo pilot here who kept a gun arsenal fake passports and a library on post hypnotic suggestion the detective headed a team, uh, which two nights after Oswald's capture raided the uptown New Orleans apartment of David Ferry at the time suspended pilot for Eastern Airlines. Ferry had been under suspension six months and had no visible income and was awaiting trial on homosexual charges. Then police hit his pad, probably hit his pad, after they learned from newspaper accounts Oswald had been a member of New Orleans Civil Air Patrol. Ferry, until his airline suspension, was commander of Oswald's small CAP group. Uh, you see, this is con this is conflating different time periods, 1956 uh, to 1960, 
uh, 19th, January 63. So yeah, you're conflating different time periods here because Oswald was not associated with anything recent with David Ferry. Oswald was a member in his teens, uh, but the detective says Ferry indicated he knew Oswald during his 1963 residence here. I don't believe that. I have no evidence to support that. It wouldn't make sense to me if that was the case. Because when you're being handled, your contact with everyone else in an operation that you're only being held on the outskirts of would be limited, very limited. The only people I feel comfortable saying Oswald knew in New Orleans uh, were Clay Shaw and Kerry Thornley. The evidence for Clay Shaw comes in the fact that Clay Shaw, or a man exactly looking like him, which it was Clay Shaw, showed up at Oswald's aunt's house looking for him after he moved to Dallas. When was that? Was it the first or second time he moved to Dallas? I don't recall. I believe it was the first time, which would put it like in 62 sometime. Late 62. Uh, but that's irrelevant. Uh, but Clay Shaw, I feel comfortable saying, knew Lee Harvey Oswald. And Carrie Thornley obviously was handling Oswald. Uh, they were Oswald's handlers for sure in, um, in New Orleans. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Kerry Thornley was being handled, obviously. Well, not obviously, but he was being handled by... Um, what the hell was her name? Jack Frazier and... Um, Clint Bolton was one of Kerry Thornley's handlers, for sure. And there was one more, but we'll talk about it another, another time. All right, so let me see... Uh, they raided the pad and found Ferry absent, but two 17-year-old high school boys there. The boys had in their possession a visa a pl application for South America. Okay, so this is um, uh, there's some there's, there's various things being conflated here, right? Um, uh, what they're talking about now in this paragraph here is that they raided the pad and found Ferry absent, but two 17-year-old high school boys there. This is the raid of David Ferry's house shortly after midnight on November 20. Fifth Monday morning, right? Early, early Monday morning, right? Just past midnight. And that is when uh, Leighton Martins and Alvin Boboof were present there. And so this is fascinating. The boys had in their possession visa applications for South America. And when questioned, handed police a card bearing the name of Jack Wasserman, Washington, D.C. attorney for racketeer Carlos Marcello police did so and Wasserman uh, arranged for their parole or he bailed them out is what they're saying so why is this important well they had just come back from Dallas uh, they had gone there with David Ferry and had come back with Sergio Arcacha in Ferry's car they made it back to the pad before midnight on November the 24th that Sunday David Ferry didn't come back to New Orleans until uh, the next day around noon or one o'clock uh, when he drove in from Hammond to New Orleans to meet with Jim Garrison when he's then placed under arrest and interviewed by every goddamn alphabet agency in the fucking world for like three or four days straight. Like, it's it's hilarious. We went over this the last time. Uh, I think we went over it the last time uh, when it said that, like, first... Uh, the police went in, and then the FBI went in, and then the fucking Secret Service went in, and then fucking Men in Black went in, and then Garrison's men went in, and they fucking asked David Ferry the same questions over and over and over again, right? So, um, it's so fucking funny to me, because David Ferry was in their custody within a couple of days of the assassination, and he was one of two shooters on the grassy knoll. And so David Ferry must have been shitting his fucking pants the whole time he was in there. <laughs> and not a single word of what he said is uh, in print anywhere, right? People worry about these fucking documents. All oh, the government won't release documents. Motherfucker, these documents are destroyed, okay? They were destroyed 50 fucking years ago, so idiots fucking wanting government to release the documents, you stupid fucks. God, I swear, I fucking hate Kennedy researchers with a passion. They're the dumbest people around. 
Hmm. All right. So let me see. Um, yeah. So here they're talking about the raid of David Ferry's place on November the 25th. Uh, extremely significant stuff here because uh, Jack Martin rats him out. Please show up. Of course, he was guilty. <laughs> this brings to light his uh, fake trip to Houston and all that stuff. So uh, second, where did Ferry get his something? This is all cut off. Uh, but he'd been flying to Texas paying. That's why it's cut off, because he was flying to Texas. Uh, third, why does an apparently minor blank, blank, blank. Why does it? Okay, let me fill in the blanks here. Why, third, why does an apparently minor. Um, he's talking about Leighton Martins and Alvin Bobuf, um have a card with the name Jack Wasserman and by implication Marcello. Uh, a connection to organized crime, right? So obviously that's what those missing words say. Um, and then fairies fake pass. What is that? What fake pass? Oh, and there's a, that's a P, right? So let me fucking screenshot this because that is a pass that says passport, right? But the P is cut off, right? This is a government release document, people. Okay, this is what the fuck they give you. Idiots. Uh, fairy's fake passport. I don't know nothing about fairy's fake, fake passport. Quasi guerrilla organization, most blank high school boys. Um, yeah. So here they're talking about why is fairy got fake passport? Why is he hanging out with a bunch of high school boys? And it says, but the Wasserman Marcello connection may be the and then more sinister thing. Okay, so yes, of course, because these guys were in Dallas with David Ferry, who was one of two shooters on the Grassy Knoll. They then go to Houston with Sergio Arcacha, right, in David Ferry's uh, Comet station wagon. Or do they get a ride to the Alamo Motel where David Ferry had parked his Comet station wagon? One of the two things happened. Odds are they drove it. Uh, but I couldn't really trace the comet past that date. And the, the fact that Ferry checked into the motel at the Alamo Motel using that comet kind of uh, implied to me that they might have left it there. Um, so, yes. Um, basically, the kids then make it down to the Winterland ice skating rink with Sergio Arcaccia, who was posing as David Ferry. This is then attested to by Roulant Chuck Rowland, not Roland Chuck Rowland, uh, who's married to Joyce Rowland. Uh, who's Joyce Roland, who her real name is uh, Mary Boots Roberts, who was the founder of the Winterland Ice Skating Rink. But we're going to spend a whole fucking couple days on the Winterland Ice Skating Rink. I don't want to give away all the shit today, even though I've already said all this stuff in previous presentations, because the information is so fucking good and juicy. It's like, oh, it it it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. So um, we're going to forget about all that stuff. But the important stuff here is showing that there's a relationship directly between Leighton Martins, Alvin Bobuf, David Ferry. Those are the three guys who were arrested on the 25th with Sergi Arcacha, who drove the kids back from the assassination, passing through Houston. Um, and uh, they had the business card of Jack Wasserman, who was a lawyer of Marcello, who David Ferry works for. Right. So we have this backdrop of Marcello is backing these guys. Uh, and if you like, if you get in trouble, here's my card. Call me. And that's exactly what the fuck happened. They got in trouble. And they had to call him. <laughs> Fourth, what influence, if any, did um, something, something, something as a juvenile or an adult? Uh, that, I don't know what they're talking about. P.S. I don't see the worth much in itself. Uh, names Ferry Wasserman arise in other connection anyway. It's good. Uh, the statements here cut off. It's, it's, it's why? I don't know. All right, so now we're going back to the Al Landry case. The Al Landry case is... Um, we talked about it briefly when we first started the David Ferry stuff. This is the... Uh, has to do with Ferry's... Probably Ferry's investigation with Eastern Air Airlines... And the fact that he molested uh, a bunch of kids and all this stuff, and that that came out during the investigation. <clears throat> it says Landry Ferry, CIA. Well, duh. <laughs> Garrison, I'll say it again, knew what time it was. 
Like, he wasn't dumb. He knew everything. Um, and I bet the fact that the proof that he knew everything was in the, is in the, you know, half the documents of his that have been destroyed over the years. So memorandum, March 28, 67, to Jim Garrison from Andrew Scambria, Assistant District Attorney, interview with Al Landry, March 23, 67. Mr. Landry was born uh, January 13, 45, and is now 22 years old. He stated to me that he first met Ferry when he was a member of the Lakefront CAP. He said this was around late 58 or early 59. He said Batista was still in power in Cuba. So he imagines it must have been late 1958. He says he was 14 years old when he joined the CAP and lived at 5221 Arts Street. He said that he first met Ferry about four months after he had joined the Lakefront CAP. The CAP used to hold meetings at the Lakefront on Friday night and Sunday afternoon on a weekly basis. He said that it was at these meetings that he met Ferry. He said that sometime in 1959, after Castro had taken over in Cuba, David Ferry disappeared for about seven to nine weeks. And the next time he saw him on a Sunday afternoon was at the CAP meeting when Ferry came to the meeting with Al Sheremy in, Ferry, uh, in Ferry's 1953 Tan Ford. Sheremy was driving the car as Ferry could not move around as he was apparently injured. Sheremy got out of the automobile and started moving all Ferry's papers and files from the CAP building and began putting them in Ferry's automobile. It seems that Ferry had some misunderstandings with Colonel Morell and Pat Prinz's mother, and as uh, these two people sort of ran the lakefront CAP, it appeared they had asked Ferry to resign. Ferry did resign from the lakefront CAP and formed his own CAP group, called them the Falcons, the Fighting Falcon Squadron. Um, he did this about five months after he had resigned from lakefront. This group actually came into existence in late 1959. It was shortly at this time that Landry said he ran away from home, which dated back to early 1960. Landry said that approximately one year later, while Ferry was living at 331 Atherton Drive, it's in Metairie, uh, Ferry told him uh, about the incident that occurred to him when he disappeared for about seven to nine weeks. Ferry mentioned this after he had a lively discussion with Landry with regard to his views concerning the Cuban situation that he and Arcacha Smith and some other Cuban friends would liberate Cuba from Castro. Now, if you're 15 fucking years old, do you give a shit about Cuba? Give me a break. This is This is grooming. CIA grooming, probably the best way to put it. Landry told him that he had no idea that Ferry could liberate Cuba and that he questioned his ability to do so. Ferry at this time told him of the incident which had occurred uh, when he was away from the city for about seven to nine weeks. Ferry said that a couple of weeks prior to the time when Landry had seen him in the car with Jeremy at the airport removing his equipment, he and several other Cubans had been to Cuba in an effort to help Cubans escape from Castro's prison. Ferry told him that during one of these visits to Cuba, he ran into some trouble and was attacked by a Castro soldier and was stabbed in the stomach. He showed Landry a scar across his stomach. Uh, approximately 10 to 15 inches long, which he said resulted from the stab wound. Ferry at this time told him that he was working for the CIA rescuing Cubans out of Castro's prison in Cuba. And I do believe this 100%. He said that he was called down from, uh, down to Miami and stayed there for approximately one week in a hotel before he was contacted by the CIA men in Miami. He said that he attributed the delay in being contacted to the fact that the CIA wanted to test him to see if he was the type of person who told his business to anybody on the street. He said that a woman from CIA was sent to his apartment and tried to get information from him about his activities with the CIA, but that he did not tell her anything. And it was after this test that he was actually contacted by the CIA people in Miami. He said that short, uh, shortly after the, uh, thereafter, he and about nine Cubans flew down to a point close to Cuba and then got on rubber rafts and went into Cuba and rescued some prisoners out of the prisons there. He said it was during this incident that he was stabbed. The soldier who stabbed him was killed by some people uh, in his party, and they carried him to safety with them. Landry says that he can recall that during his relationship with Ferry, Ferry received long-distance calls from Miami and Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, Cleveland, Ohio. And very important for numerous reasons. Miami, of course, that's important. That's a given. 
Ferry also told him that Arcacha Smith was the third man in line in the Cuban hierarchy when Cuba would be liberated. The number one man lived in Miami. So here we have Arcacha uh, being named as being in the hierarchy for if the if Castro were to be ousted, right? But as we'll see after the Bay of Pigs, the ousting and the killing and the attempted assassination, the hundred plots against Castro are fucking CIA fiction. CIA fiction. All right, so uh, the number one man lived in Miami. Landry said that he can recall that at one time the number one man whose name he can't remember. Funny how these guys can always have such selective memory. Uh, I can't remember at the moment was supposed to make a trip down to New Orleans to see how the Cuban Revolutionary Front was making out. The Cuban Re Revolutionary Front, another front organization. Um, and the plane he was to come on hijacked and taken to Cuba. <laughs> he said the ferry then asked him if he would like to make a trip to Miami to pick up the number one man and fly him down to New Orleans in a private plane. Landry told him that he would go with him, but ferry never did mention anything to him about this. Landry said that Ferry often told him that when Cuba would be liberated from Castro, he would be a very big man in Cuba, and he wanted Al Landry to go and live with him in Cuba. Remember, Landry's only 15 at this fucking time. Probably 14 at the time the conversation's going on. Uh, he said they would live like kings because the people would always look at them as their savior. Ferry said that there were three branches working for the liberation of Cuba, one in Miami, one in New Orleans, and one in Texas. Landry said that after the Bay of Pigs, Ferry became annoyed with the CIA and often belittled the CIA and President Kennedy. Now, that's very true. There was a, a lot of anger and confusion amongst the anti-Castro Cubans who felt like they were betrayed. Um, but they weren't, and they weren't, they weren't really betrayed by Kennedy. And I don't want to get into a Bay of Pigs conversation. Um, but the CIA betrayed the fucking Cubans. Because I can tell you with certainty, and you can look into this, look into... Uh, Gordon Novell's statements on where the arms and all the money went to Inter Armco out of Virginia. Inter Armco um, was one of these CIA um, arms companies heavily involved in the export of fucking weapons to the Israelis to fight the Palestinians. Duh. Gordon Novell confirmed that all the arms that got stolen in the home of Louisiana raids in 62 didn't go to no fucking Cubans in any way. That was after the Bay of Pigs. And so all that shit went to the goddamn Israelis. The CIA was betraying the Cubans from the fucking beginning. So I don't want to hear shit about these alleged plots to take out Castro. They were working with Castro the whole fucking time. It's ridiculous. God damn, I fucking... Ugh, I hate bad history. Bad history is no fucking good. All right, so Landry said that after the Bay of Pigs, Ferry became annoyed with the CIA and often belittled the CIA and President Kennedy. He said the CIA and President Kennedy had screwed up the whole invasion and that they had betrayed the Cuban people by refusing to send air support that was promised. Landry said that Ferry had a blackboard in his apartment and he often drew on his own blackboard the actual plans for the invasion of Cuba, explaining what the Cubans were supposed to do and at what point the CIA was supposed to send the air support. Remember, Ferry was a pilot working with the CIA. He knew what the fuck was going on at the Bay of Pigs. Landry said he talked as if he knew all about the battle plans and the invasion, because he did. Ferry told him how the boats got in touch with the CIA and requested the air support, and CIA had Kennedy on the hotline and how Kennedy was supposed to give the okay for air support. But he said that Kennedy and the CIA did not intervene like they said they would, so he's not putting the blame here just on Kennedy. He's blaming Kennedy and the CIA, because remember, the CIA had their own pilots because he was one of them. The Cubans were promised by the CIA that when the time was right after some troops had already gotten on the island, they would furnish the air support. The CIA was lying to the Cubans just as much as the fucking, uh, just as much as anybody else, right? And so here's the thing. I'm starting to put two and two together on this. Like, why would you even have the Bay of Pigs if you know it's going to fail going in? So you confront that you blew all the money on the operation when it really went to fucking Israel. That's why. That's what happened in the Bay of Pigs. Landry said that he can remember going to Arcacha Smith's house on the lakefront somewhere with Ferry and some other people and watched actual films of the invasion. 
Landry said that he joined the service in June of 62 and came out in June of 66. He said that he had no contact with Ferry during the time he was in the service and actually had not seen him for a few months before he had joined the service. Memorandum, April 14th, 67, Jim, to Jim Garrison from Jim Alcock, Executive Assistant District Attorney, re Lawrence Fox. You know, I'm scratching my head here. If I'm not mistaken, Lawrence Fox was an alias of one of these mob guys, either Marcello or Traficante or one of them. Probably just coincidence. On Friday, April 14th, 1967, I, along with Kent Sims of our staff, interviewed Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox is presently employed by Hauser American Printing Company at 441 Gravier Street, Gravier Street in the city of New Orleans. Lawrence Fox was a CAP cadet from approximately November 1955 until March of 1957. His unit was located at the New Orleans airport. During this time, he does not recall ever having met Lee Harvey Oswald. So let's just rem I just want to remind everybody. That Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, as we found out in the earlier part of these documents, uh, that Lee Harvey Oswald was actually a part of the CAP. He wasn't just a, a guest on the day he was photographed at the barbecue. He was actually a member, but he only went, he only attended approximately five or six times. And that was it. So it wasn't like he was there and he was like a regular who did it for, for years, like a lot of these guys who, who are some of these names that we're talking about. Oswald showed up six times. That's it in 1956. So that just keep that in mind when you think of Oswald and his participation in all this stuff. Very limited. Uh, during this time, he does not recall ever having met Lee Harvey Oswald. From March 1957 through December 14, 1959, Fox was a member of the Armed Services United States Air Force. In the latter part of December 1960, he again joined the Civil Air Patrol as a senior member. He remained a member of the CAP until approximately October 1960. During this time, he was the administrative assistant to David W. Ferry, who was the commanding officer of the unit. Fox recalls having gone to Ferry's house in Jefferson Parish on a few occasions. The times he was at Ferry's house were usually at a party given among CAP members. As he recalls, some of the members of the squadron at this time were Al Meister... Carl Costa and Leighton Martins. So this back up a little bit. Um, all right. So this is happening all in sixty two. Uh, and this happened in, let me see, during the summer of 61. Um, I'm trying to determine whether or not this particip the participation here in this CAP is in the Falcon Squadron or not. Um, I don't believe it is. I believe this is in the legitimate CAP prior to the Falcon Squadron. Um, during the summer of 61, Lawrence Fox, because uh, this guy, Lawrence Fox, uh, who I'm not sure who he is, um, associate of David Ferry, obviously, um, he was in the CAP, then he left to go into the Air Force, and then he comes back to the CAP, where he worked with David Ferry. So I'm assuming this is all during the legitimate CAP years prior to the Fighting Falcon Squadron, which was like a fucking bootleg CIA CAP, right? So during the summer of 61, Lawrence Fox listed funds for the Crusade to Free Cuba, so you have a connection from the CAP to the CIA, because remember, 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 you have to remember this. None of these motherfucking organizations gave a fuck about Cuba, right? They might have one or two useful idiots who go out and do some preaching, right? But for the most part, these organizations are designed to raise money and fucking funnel money in the CIA, and they laundered them using these one-man churches that Garrison under that Garrison uncovered. So that's the deal. When you see like any of these Cuban organizations, just think CIA. 100% of the time. So, but here you have a member of the CAP who was in the, uh, the Air Force, who's now back in the CAP, who's now obviously trying to raise funds for a CIA organization. Hello. Uh, as a result of this work, he was introduced by David Ferry to Sergio Arcacha Smith. Also active at this time with Arcacha and Ferry was Leighton Martins, right? So Leighton Martins in 62 is involved in the burglary at the at HOMA with uh, Gordon Novell and uh, Louis Rebell and these guys. 
Uh, in fact, Fox and Martins on several occasions went out soliciting funds together. On about two occasions, Fox and Ferry went to the International Trademark to solicit funds. However, Fox does not recall what office they went to in the trademark. <clears throat> trademark being Clay Shaw's trademark. He does recall that it was necessary for them to take an elevator to get to the office. On none of these occasions did Fox meet Clay Shaw. However, Fox seems to recall having met Clay Shaw briefly in the year 1955. The occasion for this meeting was the Inter-American Investment Conference. Lawrence Fox's mother was Mr. Nutter's secretary. Lawrence believes Mr. Nutter was the president of the International House at that time. What is in the notes here? Something code? Something code question mark. Is, uh, does, does Garrison believe that there is some code, coded language being uh, employed here? <clears throat> Fox does not recall having been in Ferry's Louisiana Avenue Parkway apartment in the year of 1963. He does not know Perry Russo, Nils Peterson, Kenny Carter, or Sandra Moffat. Oh, these names, I oh, these names get me going because these are some of the first names I studied in Kennedy, and I haven't studied in quite some time, which we will come back to at some point during this show. Um, Fox recalls that a girl by the name of Carolyn Taylor, a CAP cadet, did some typing in the summer of 1961 for the Crusade to Free Cuba. Fox will attempt to locate any CIP, CAP records he has, and should he find any, will call us and make them available. I'm starting to drift a little, and I'll tell you why, because I think that when you see this overt targeting of children that we're seeing today uh, in all kinds of different uh, areas, right, that we see all over the media, that is uh, obviously intentional, Um this targeting of children's been going on forever, <laughs> fucking forever, but it was in the shadows, right? So all this stuff on the CAP, they're involving children to do stuff with uh, CIA organizations, right? So yeah, uh, as we get, like I said before, as we get to the end of this file over the next couple of weeks, um, we'll see that David Ferry was directly connected to a whole child trafficking ring involving the CAP and Catholic churches and stuff. So memorandum, January 19th, 1967. Jim Garrison, district attorney, uh, from investigator Lynn Wazell, referenced a telephone conversation with agent number one. Agent number one called Lynn Wazell and told him that Dave Ferry and he had gone to an apartment off of Veterans Highway to look for some dirty films last night. That this apartment was one of Carlos Marcello's apartment houses and that the apartment was 18 North, but he didn't know the address. He said there were about 15 people present. He believed that the operator of the show was a Cuban named Carlos. Agent number one also stated that there were three colored girls whose names were Shwanda, Margaret, and Barbara. He said that Margaret has been with Dave since 1962 and that she knows plenty of his associates. Shwanda and Barbara haven't been around that long and that Margaret was uh, Dave's favorite. He said that David asked him, agent number one, to burglarize his clerk's house, this clerk's house, because he felt like uh, he could make some easy money. He also felt this clerk always had a thousand dollars on him and knows he must uh, kept money in his house. Agent number one said the clerk uh, was due at the airport Monday and Dave would get his license plate number, check it out and find out where the clerk lives. And then they would burglarize the house with Dave acting as the lookout man and Dave going in. Agent number one also said that Ferry put money in the NBC bank yesterday. Agent number one said he doesn't know where Ferry gets the money from because Ferry only makes a living expenses by teaching student flyers at the airport. Agent number one said Dave was carrying a rifle in his car and he said he was going to shoot one of those kids that burglarized his apartment. Loazel asked him when the apartment was burglarized and what was taken. And agent number one said it was burglarized a few days ago and two reels of dirty film. A letter and some pictures of Dave screwing the nigger girl, Margaret, and a picture of Frank Woodruff in an army camp standing naked, jerking off. Later on this date, agent number one called me back. The Wazelle and, uh, and told me that a Cuban was out talking to Dave a few minutes ago, approximately three o'clock PM. And he was sure that Dave called the Cuban Carlos. He said that he didn't believe that he, this was the same Carlos who had shown the film last night.
Agent number one also said that Dave Ferry told him that the clerk would be at the airport Saturday and that agent number one was to burglarize the clerk's house maybe Saturday night, but that he would go by himself and would burglarize the house when everybody was sleeping. Loiselle asked agent number one why Dave decided that he was not going to go with agent number one, and agent number one said that from here on out, I'm going to leave the burglaries to you. That will be your department. Agent number one said that he would call back tomorrow to find out what he should do about the burglary. Just uh, interesting stuff, right? Just background information and character development on David Ferry. July 23rd, 1966. Uh, this is my... Oh, this is the David Ferry uh, suicide note, right? Uh, one was typed and one was handwritten, I guess. Uh, this is my last will and testament written uh, by my own hand while of sound mind and body. I bequeath all of my possessions... Um, real, movable, and immovable. Um, I can't read that. Something, books, airplane, auto, and whatever else I may own or have a right to at the time of my death to my dearest friend, Alvin R. Boboof. This is really important stuff. And you need to keep in mind that Alvin Bobuf is still alive, people. He's still alive outside of New Orleans. He's about 76 years old. He got at least a couple years left in him. Hopefully he stayed healthy um, because he can still be prosecuted. And he's the only person alive who still knows the inner details of what happened with David Ferry in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. If you Google his name, his fucking home address will come up. Just saying. Um, I bequeath especially a diamond ring uh, to be found hidden in my dining room table. I hereby conceal and declare null any wills heretofore made by me. I appoint Alvin R. Boobouf as executor of my estate and request that no bond or inventory he be, requ be required of him. If any just debts or uh, taxes remain to be paid at my death, I direct that he pay them out of my estate. I declare I have no uh, forced heirs, David Ferry. I ask Alvin to notify my brother Parmalee T. Ferry in Rockford, Illinois, and uh, Bishop George Hyde in Alberta, Georgia. Okay, remember this name. Bishop George Hyde. No relation to Ruth Hyde Payne, by the way, um, but extremely significant in the scheme of things. All right, envelope, David Perry's note was in. Uh, memorandum, July 12th, 1967, to Jim Garrison. From Robert E. Lee, Assistant District Attorney, referenced David Ferry. David Ferry was piled with Eastern Airlines in 1959. I was employed with Eastern Airlines while studying at Tulane in undergraduate school and completing my law studies at Tulane. Uh, during the course of my employment as a flight pursuer with Eastern, I had uh, on occasion been a member of the same flight crew with David Ferry. After graduation from Tulane uh, Law School, I continued to fly with Eastern mostly at night and practiced law out of my office on Veterans Highway in Metairie on a full-time basis. I opened my law office in August of 1960. My second or third client was David Ferry. Ferry had purchased some stock in, in a closed corporation whose headquarters were located in Honduras. In addition to buying the stock, he had flown down to Honduras to look at a uh, Kahuni Nut Venture. Simply it was this. Uh, the Kahuni Nut has a juice which, when squeezed out, mixed with certain compound, will harden into a mass as strong as iron and, of course, rust-proof and will endure for centuries. There are only two machines available built to squeeze the juice from Kahuni Nuts. <laughs> it sounds like a scam. One is in Chicago and the other is in Belize, Honduras. The owner of the machine in Chicago won't exhibit or sell his machine since he's preparing to move his equipment to Honduras to start production. Incidentally, there is only one area in the world where the kahuni nut grows in the jungles of Honduras. Uh, so that if Ferry acts fast, he and the corporation can lease all the land growing kahuni nuts. <laughs> However, the corporation, i.e. the president and his wife and Ferry, have to uh, buy the only remaining machine, the one 
hidden in the jungles of Honduras. I don't remember the president's name, but he knows where the machine is, but he must give $2,000 to an official of the Honduran government, and in return, the official who also knows where the machine is will issue an exclusive work permit to harvest and manufacture Kahuni nut juice. God, this is fucking hilarious. I'm dying. Ferry purchased $4,500 of stock and gave the president of the corporation $2,000 for the machine. Neither Ferry's money nor the machine ever got together, and Ferry came to me. The last occasion with David Ferry in my office was when he told me that he wanted to adopt a 17-year-old boy by the name of Sheremy. I advised him that I would charge him $75 and begin research to call back in a week or so. About three days later, he came back to the office extremely ag uh, agitated. Sheremy had joined the Marine Corps, and Ferry wanted him out and he was prepared to pay any amount. I patiently explained that the Marine Corps would not discharge except for medical reasons or moral turpitude. Ferry seized on the moral turpitude and asked me to explain exactly what it meant. Upon telling him of more, that moral turpitude included homosexual offenses, he cut me off abruptly and excitedly claiming, that's it, that's it. Ferry told me that he and Sheremy had a homosexual relations. Hmm. With a kid who was 17 at the time. 15 when he was hanging out with them. I told Ferry that I didn't believe him and further that the Marine Corps would insist that a drastic admission such as this be in writing. Uh, Ferry immediately pulled my typewriter to him and typed three single-spaced pages giving dates, etc. When he was finished, he triumphantly thrust the document, document towards me with a smirk on his face. I read it once, tore it in three pieces, pulled him to the door and shoved him out. I told him I didn't want him in the office again and that he owed me $75 for my trouble and to mail it to my office. On the few occasions that I was a crew member on Ferry's flights, he was captain. We flew to Houston, Corpus Christi, and Brownsville, with stops between New Orleans, Houston, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, New Iberia, Lake Charles, Beaumont, Port Arthur, thence to Houston, Corpus Christi, Brownsville, and back the same way the same day. As a rule, the flight would have about 30-minute hangover between stops for passenger, deplaning, baggage, cargo handling, etc., uh, during this period of time, the captain would go into the station manager's operations office and check uh, the weather ahead, fuel requirements, etc. The last year I flew off and on as a crew member with Ferry was 1962. Ferry never got out of the cockpit from the minute we took off in New Orleans at 11.40 a.m. until we returned at midnight. Ordinarily, the captain at the end of the trip would stop in operations uh, if for no other reason than to stow his flight bag until the next trip. Ferry never went through operations while starting the flight or ending the trip and uh, the times I was part of his crew. I casually asked him about this in Houston once and he told me that his life was in danger, that the communists were out to get him. He did in fact appear to be very disturbed on every occasion. When I knew him in the beginning, he was very talkative and cheerful, but when I saw him again in 1962, he was grim to say the least and totally unresponsive to his fellow pilots or crew members. I think I was the only one he really talked to and then only because I was an attorney. I can remember occasions in 1961 and 1962 when Ferry would stop by the office unexpectedly, usually on Saturday afternoons when my office building was deserted. On these visits, he began to tell me something of his extracurricular activities, but only after inspecting my office for bugging equipment and asking me to swear that I was not taping him. These activities consisted of flying to Cuba and back with passengers once to the Isle of Pines. He would make these trips via Tampa, and one of the keys, uh, and then on to Cuba. He also mentioned training Cuban guerrillas. In 1961 or 1962, the chief pilot for Eastern in New Orleans asked me in my capacity as an attorney to check into the report that Ferry had stolen an ancient 2,000-year-old crucifix from a Greek Orthodox Church, Orthodox Church early, uh, either in Louisiana, uh, Louis Louisville, Kentucky, or Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm not sure. I believe the Jefferson Parish authorities can give us the necessary information in this matter. It seems to me that Ferry and others ransomed this crucifix. The figure 20,000 comes to mind. What a scumbag this guy is. The last time I saw or heard of David Ferry was in 1962, and that's from Robert E. Lee. Uh, not the Robert E. Lee who's related to Oswald, uh, a different pilot, Robert E. Lee. All right, so let me go over this real quick, and then we will wrap it up for the day. Um, this is some background information on Ferry. Uh, factual background for reasons stated in discharge of Captain Ferry. This stems from the uh, his firing from Eastern Airlines, which uh, happened in early 1963. 
Uh, if you recall, G. Ray Gill was his lawyer. G. Ray Gill, the mob attorney, attorney for Carlos Marcello, who also happened to provide a alibi for David Ferry on November 22nd, despite the fact that David Ferry had been in New Orleans since uh, November the 20th. At least November 20th. So, Ferry, factual background for reasons stated in discharge of Captain Ferry. During 1961 and 1962, the following criminal charges were brought against Captain Ferry in Orleans and Jefferson Parish based on sworn affidavits of complaining witnesses. Orleans, number one, extortion, no prost, January 4th, 63. Um, public intimidation of state witness. That was, uh, um, I don't think we covered that here, but I'm going, I just did that in the last chapter I worked on in my book uh, involving the Al Sheremy case and Eric uh, Crochet um, and Andrew Blackman and Sergi Arcacha. So yeah, good stuff that will be in my book. Speaking of which, you can go pre-order my book. Uh, uh, the link is down below. It's uh, buymeacoffee.com slash JFK book. It would uh, be a big help to me if you did so. Um all right, uh, another charge, crime against nature, null prost. Okay, null prost means um, they didn't prosecute, right? Charges were brought, and then they said, nah, we're not going to do this. Okay, so you got a guy who's clearly a pedophile. Clearly there's evidence against him. Shows up with a fucking mob attorney, and then they null prost the shit. Hilarious, right? Uh, Jefferson Parish, um, indecent behavior with a juvenile and contributing to the delinquents of a minor, all null prost. Um, and then 10308, it doesn't say what that charge is, but he was found not guilty. That charge was probably, um, something to do with, uh, sex with a minor. Uh, but since he was not guilty, the charge itself was probably, um, like, what do they call it? When they hide, uh, what a charge is. Seal, they sealed it or whatever it was. Uh, and then 10482 and 10483, um, charges unknown, null pros, right? So the whole bunch of things, he molested a bunch of kids, he was involved with, uh, you know, intimidating witness, you know, all that stuff. I explain all this stuff in the book coming up. And uh, yeah, it all goes away. <laughs> it's being in the CIA pays, I guess. All right, so B, the following information, which should have been revealed in the application for employment or on the pre-employment physical. So this is where they're trying to get him uh, fired since he probably didn't have sufficient evidence to can him under the, 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 the gay shit. Um, they were trying to get him from failing to disclose information on an application, right? So uh, the following information, which should have been revealed in the application or or for employment or on the pre-employment physical examination form was discovered during the investigation uh, conducted as a result of the above criminal charges. Number one, November 1944, the St. Charles Seminary refused to allow Ferry to continue in the seminary because of his emotional instability. Um, and here they name uh, B Bishop Joseph Marling. Uh, thereafter, Ferry was treated for his mental problems by Dr. A.K. Gardner and Dr. Wilford Gill of Cleveland, Ohio. After the above treatment, Ferry reapplied at St. Charles Seminary, but was refused admittance. Over a period of years, Ferry has attempted to gain admittance to other seminaries, but has been refused on the basis of his record at St. Charles, meaning he's a pedophile. Uh, prior to his applying at Eastern, Ferry had been employed at Rocky River High School. In 1941, Ferry suffered severely from asthma and hay fever, which, ha which he controlled by administering shots to himself. All right, and so now we are moving into an interview of David Ferry. We'll get to hear, uh, this occurred in uh, 1966, and we'll get to hear uh, about David Ferry in his own words. And so this, ladies and gentlemen, is going to have to wait until tomorrow. I believe that is all for today. And uh, all right, so I appreciate you tuning in, and I will... Uh, I'll see y'all tomorrow.